All right, so here with Nate, uh, one of the sales associates at Lenko Tactical, and he's going to go over uh, his one uh, firearm he has here. So uh, what do you got here, and uh, what's on it, and why do you have it that way? Hey, guys, this is my AR-15. Uh, I have it here at the shop. A lot of you guys have been in the shop. have seen this rifle multiple times. It's kind of like our demo gun. Uh, basically, it's set up as a very simple rifle. Uh, it's kind of minimalist by a lot of people's standards because it doesn't have a rail forearm, it doesn't have a cappuccino maker hanging off the side. It's basically set up just to be a lightweight carbine that's uh, all about performance, right? So basically I have a no-name lower receiver from a couple years ago with a quality trigger group in it. Uh, it's all LWRC parts that got off my buddy that works for the company. Uh, I have a Bravo Company USA upper receiver, it's also their barrel. 1.7 twist uh, with a permanently attached A2 flash rider, bring out to a legal 16 inches. Fixed A2 flash rider, MOE handguard with uh, the mag pull vertical grip. I have uh, EOTech 552 that's been beat up overseas for the last couple years but still going strong. Nice armor rear sight that uh, I got off a buddy of mine that's an armor. Bravo Company extended charging handle, this is Mod 3. Uh, mil spec buffer tube, CTR buttstock. MOE handguard, and then uh, Blue Force Gear Vickers sling, right? So, a lot of people say, well, why do you have it set up this way? What I say to people is you only really need two things for a fighting weapon, right? You want an optic of some sort, and you want a flashlight. If I have to choose between having a flashlight and having an optic, I will actually choose the flashlight over the optic. Just because 8% uh, deadly force encounters in states are going to occur at night, you need to be able to properly identify your target before you engage your target. So, you want to make sure that you're shooting that gangbanger, not your drunk cousin Willie coming over at 2 o'clock to crash on your sofa, all right? One of the questions I get a lot is why do I have my rifle set up with a two-point sling? Why don't I use a one-point sling? A lot of guys buy one-point slings not really understanding what purpose it has and what it's really meant for, right? Real quick, I'll just show you. A two-point sling is a little bit more versatile. You have the ability to cinch your sling in, and it's going to create a tight triangle between the weapon and uh, the actual sling itself. Yeah. What I mean to say is that you're not going to have a strap nylon going down inside of the weapon like you would with a three-point sling, where it's going to get in the way of your bolt release, get in the way of you getting to your charging handle, get into your magazine. Uh, it's just uh, it's an improved version of three points, really what it is. What I like about the two-point is that I can drive out with the weapon, and if I have to go to my secondary weapon, I can just throw it to the side, go to my pistol. If I go and take a kneeling position, I'm not going to put my muzzle in dirt. When I bring my weapon over to the side, it's basically going to stay there. I have my hands free. I can work on stuff. I can walk around, run around, carry stuff. It's basically going to stay where I put it. Now, the alternative is, is that you can take it. You can't do this with all slings, but let's set mine up so you can. You take your two point, and now you can transition over to a one point sling. Now, the advantage with a one point sling is that you can go from shooting strong side, transition over, and shoot left side. That's nice if you're going around corners, or if uh, you're sitting in a vehicle all day, you can sit with the, the weapon between your legs. It's nice for like CQB, for like a SWAT cop application. Guy that's not going to be patrolling all day with the long gun on, right? This is kind of like a throw it on and you're ready to go. It's good for weapons retention. The problem with that I have with the one point is it starts smacking in the crotch. If you swing it over to the left and you go to your secondary pistol, you're going to have it slowly start to creep in the front and then start smacking in your crotch again. If you take a kneeling position, you're planting your muzzle right in the dirt. If you have more obstruction, you go fire down the round once you go back to your long gun. You're going to blow your barrel potentially hurt yourself, right? So both slings have their their purpose, but I basically have mine set up this way just to show you guys that, hey, the merits of both systems. I personally almost exclusively use two-point sling the rest of the time on other guns. One other question I get is, well, what's wrong with uh, the factory parts that come on stock rifles? Why do I need all this high-speed gear? This is a mad cool CTR stock. It's an improvement over the MOE stock in the sense that it has a friction fit and it has a QD socket right here for that QD swivel so I can take my sling on and off. If you don't run a sling, there's no point in buying a CTR. Just buy the cheaper MOE stock, right? Uh, the reason why I prefer the CTR stock, it's my favorite stock, is it's lightweight, it has a rubberized butt pad, uh, it has a friction lock which is nice, and also you have the adjustment on the inside. You shoot from the bench or you shoot from the prone. What some guys have noticed is that they'll take their support hand, go to pull the butt stock in their shoulder pocket, actually engage the, the catch, they'll slide the stock forward while they're trying to fire. 
Other thing is the OEM stock is not as strong. It's made from a different grade of plastic. I've seen personally three different uh, servicemen break off the toe of their butt stock. So it, it does the job. It's what's standard issue, but it's not good enough. There's better products out there. So if you're looking for a sling up or a butt stock upgrade, and you want to use a sling, get the CTR. If you're not going to run sling, just buy the MOE if you want to use the Magpul style. Another option you have over here is the Viltor, it's the Emon. It's very similar to uh, the plastic that the Magpul stuff is made out of. It's high grade, it has QD sockets made into it. It also has a larger cheek weld, it's more of an oval shape. And you also have a storage compartment down here to keep uh, spare batteries, spare firing, you know, pin, extractor, you know, earplugs, whatever you want to keep in it, right? Downside is that your catch is pretty much the same as on the standard M4 stock, where you can still accidentally engage it by pulling your shoulder pocket. Uh, another Magpul butt stock that they came out with, you know, to be competitive with the Viltor is this guy right here. This is uh, the ACS stock. You have a waterproof storage compartment on both sides, and you also have another waterproof storage compartment down here. So you can see it's very similar to the Viltor, and also the curvature of the cheek piece. It's going to give you a better cheek weld over standard M4 stock over the MOE or CTR, but uh, it's just it's just going to add a little bit more weight and bulk to it. Otherwise, it's made out of that same uh, high strength polymer that everything else Magpul makes. Hand grips is kind of personal preference. I don't like the A2. I don't like the little nub there that rubs in your fingers. And at the same time, I don't really like the soft rubber grips. Uh, I like the hard polymer. Uh, there's a lot more you can do with this than you can with the, the A2. You have a little storage part in the back. Once again, you can store batteries. You can start, store. Uh, you know, fire components. You can keep a couple suicide rounds in there. Uh, it's just a nice feature to have. Also, uh, you have different plugs that will hold those different accessories that you want to keep in it. And you can order those separate. We carry them here in the shop. Uh, as far as the charge panel goes, the Bravo Company is the way to go. In the old days, what the, the service taught was that you loaded the magazine with your right hand, and then you went and did the sneak flight to charge the weapon that way. Uh, last 10 years, global war and terror, we learned that that's not what you want to do. You want to keep a master firing grip on the pistol grip at all times, and you want to use your support hand to do everything. So you want to use that to load the magazine, to hit the bolt release, to charge the weapon quickly. It's a big, it's a big deal with being able to really manipulate the weapon properly. Uh, what it's going to allow me to do is, even if I'm shooting support side, I do my reload or I get stoppage, I can reach over and charge it a lot easier than if I have a standard, uh, standard charging angle, right? Other thing about it is if it's winter time here in Pennsylvania, it gets pretty cold, we snow on the ground, you wear mittens, you wear gloves, you're going to be able to charge the weapon with heavy gloves on a lot easier than if you have the OEM charging, right? Rear sight's a matter of personal preference. I think a lot of guys kind of overkill it. This Knight's Armament, I mean, I got it for free. It's a good sight. It's a limited edition USMC engraved one, but would I ever spend my own money? No. I would just go ahead and put a, an M-Bus by Magpul on it. Um, you know, something along those lines. There's a lot of good options out there with Troy and you know Midwest and everybody else. Everybody's making a rear sight. Most of them are aircraft grade aluminum. If it's a backup iron sight, it's a backup iron sight. I've personally never used backup iron sights when deployed overseas. Uh, if I use a good enough quality optic, I don't, and I, I do my part, I change the batteries, make sure it's operating properly, then I don't have to worry about going to my secondary. It's, good, it's still nice to have, you know, it's something that you want to have on a fighting rifle, but at the same time, I, I would spend more money on my optic than I would on my rear sight. Optic, like I said, is the EOTech 552. It's night vision compatible. That means I can take my PBS 14 monocular, mount that behind my optic, and now I can look through my night optic and see the reticle on my day optic on the EOTech, right? Uh, if you're not going to buy a $4,000 PBS 14, don't waste the money on the 552. Just go ahead and buy a 512, which is this exact same model, just isn't MVG compatible, right? So don't think that you're going to buy a 552 and you're going to turn it on and you're going to be able to see in the dark. It doesn't work that way. Um, MOE handguard, super lightweight polymer. It's a great replacement for the standard oval traditional uh, OEM handguards. Uh, it's got a little bit more texture to it. You have these rails here where you can mount a uh, scout mount light, mount a short section Picatinny rail. Here, what I did was I took a, a sling swivel and just mounted it. This isn't a Magpul thing, it's something I figured out on my own, uh, just so I can hook up my, my sling where I want it to. It's going to keep your weight down, it's also going to keep the cost down. It's, uh, it's carving, you know, it's a 14 half inch barrel. Uh, you get a 16 inch barrel gun. Don't forget, this is a service rifle, it's not a sniper rifle. I'm not a big advocate of putting like $250 Timmy triggers in it or putting you know, $400 rails on it that are free floated. I don't need this gun to be free floated. 
This weapon's capable of shooting out 500 yards hitting a man-sized target all day long. That's all I really want out and what I should expect out of it. Uh, my choice flashlight, I'm a big fan of Surefire for the weapons lights when it comes to long guns. Uh, I actually prefer to use the TLR1 and TLR2 for handgun lights, but you can also get a TLR1 here at the shop. If you don't have a whole lot of money spend, $300 Surefire Scout, go ahead and buy, uh, buy a dual purpose light. Buy one that you can take off your handgun, put on your long gun, take it off your long gun, put it back on your handgun, like the TLR1, TLR2, or even the Surefire uh, pistol light. So the reason why I have this set up this way is because I shoot as much left handed as I do right. You know, I shoot gun side, I shoot support side, so I can do my flashlight with my support hand when I'm shooting right handed. When I transition over, I can still engage my flashlight by using my support hand, which is now my right hand. Uh, flash fighter, a lot of guys ask about flash fighters. This is just basic A2 flash fighter. A2 okay. Flash Rider came out in the 1980s when we switched from the M16A1 to the M16A2. It's still a quality piece of gear. It still does a really good job reducing flash and it actually acts like a, a little bit like a compensator. <clears throat> the reason why I don't like compensators and brakes is that usually if you're shooting next to a guy that has a brake or a comp on it, you're going to feel it in your face. It makes the gun louder, creates a lot more pressure that's blown out to the side. It's good for the shooter, but it's not good for the teammate. So if you're ever on the firing line and you got a guy next to you shooting with a brake, you're going to know what I mean. It's just going to rock your world, and you're just going to put your rifle down, wait for him to finish and leave, so you can resume your training. So, a lot of thoughts put into the flash fighters. Unfortunately, a lot of guys buy the ones that look the coolest and don't exactly perform the best. If you're going to change out the A2 for a real basic flash fighter, I would suggest going with the Smith Enterprise, or maybe just a basic Yankee Hill Phantom, something like that. Keep your cross down, and keep the weapon effective. Uh, all in all, that's basically the layout of this weapon. Mission drives the gear. I mean, there's a time where you're going to want a free float handguard. Hand you're going to want an A2 style buttstock or a different style buttstock. It's going to be different times where you set your weapon up for the, the mission that's at hand. So if I want to shoot 500 yards exclusively, I'm probably going to take my EOTech off. I'm going to take my uh, my ACOG here, 4 power Marine Corps issue ACOG, because I'm going to be shooting extended distance. If I'm kicking indoors all day and I know I'm not going to be shooting anywhere more than 50 yards, well, maybe I'm going to put a, a standard red dot, like an aim point or a T1, instead of the EOTech. I like the EOTech because it's the best all around optic for close and far range. It's one of the reasons why uh, the majority of guys in uniform are purchasing or the units are buying in form. Uh, you're seeing a big shift the last couple years where, you know, for years people said EOTechs aren't as reliable as aim points. They've really done a good job of their quality control and uh, every day guys are going to harm's way using EOTech. Right. So it's a common grade optic. This optic's been in Iraq two times. I proven how out of it, it's not going to break. You don't have to worry about that. So you really get what you what you pay for. It's worth to spend a couple extra dollars, get a quality piece of gear, put nothing but quality components on your weapon, and you're going to have a, a legacy gun that's going to perform for the rest of your life. It's going to be an heirloom. It's not going to be an issue with uh, having failures. So if it's a target gun, it's a toy gun, I mean, I still encourage people to put the best quality parts that they can. Otherwise, uh, no, that's about it for this weapon. Uh, that's basically all I got. All right, thank you for your time, Nate. No problem. Thank you.